Hey guys, today's topic for the video lecture is viruses. Please make sure you are filling in your notes organizer as I go through the PowerPoint. So let's start by talking about what is a virus. A virus is this tiny little non-living particle that depends on a host in order to be able to reproduce. So non-living is a key word here. Why do we consider viruses non-living? Simply because they don't have all of the characteristics of life, those things we learned, at, learned about at the very beginning of the semester. So here are the characteristics of life. You can see I've crossed off the ones that they don't have, um, and I left the ones that they do have, but I put these little asterisks by living things reproduce. Do you remember why that one sort of gets a question mark? Why do we not cross that off but not exactly say that they can do it? Um, it's because viruses can't reproduce on their own. They have to have that host cell in order to be able to reproduce. So that one's sort of like straddling the, the definition of life. So you can see here, here's a comparison between a virus and a cell, which is obviously a part of a living organism. It's comparing and contrasting structure, reproduction, genetic code, growth and development, the use of energy, response to their environment, and change over time. Here are some examples of viruses. Most of these you've probably heard of before. You get vaccinations against most of these uh, when you are just a very small child, like measles and mumps. Uh, the chicken pox you may or may not have had. Uh, you've heard of influenza, the flu. You've heard of the cold. You've heard of AIDS, which is caused by the HIV virus. Um, take a look at this list. You can write some of these down under number three on your notes organizer. So where exactly did these viruses come from, these tiny little things? Well, remember, the two main parts of a virus are the outer protein coat and the inner genetic material. And those are parts, those are things we find inside of a cell. So there's a lot of evidence that suggests that viruses came from these original parts of cells. Um, of course, the genetic material that's found in viruses is very similar to that found in the genes of living organisms. But the question is, and the, we still don't know the answer to it, is how in the world did they find a way to exist outside of the cell? Here's an interesting chart comparing the sizes of various items. Uh, from this range here, these are things that can only be seen with an electron microscope. Here are things that can be seen with a light microscope, and you can see sort of what falls into that range. So on your notes organizer, I want you to put these things in the following order. Here's a virus. Here's a prokaryotic cell. And then here we have eukaryotic cells. So cells that have nuclei. And you can see the virus is very, very small. It can really only be seen with an electron microscope. They usually fall in the 50 to 100 nanometer range. Then you've got prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells that can be seen with the microscopes we have here at school, the compound light microscope. So viruses are very tiny when you compare them to bacteria cells or to protists or to uh, fungi cells or plant cells or animal cells. Okay, so like I previously mentioned, viruses consist of two main parts. The protein capsid, which is the outside shell. So here's the capsid in this virus. Here's the capsid in this virus. And this is our bacteriophage, the one we're most familiar with. Here's the capsid for that virus. And then in the inside, we have genetic material, which is, of course, nucleic acid, um, DNA or RNA. So this one's got RNA. Inside this little sphere here, we've got some sort of genetic material. And then here in this bacteriophage, we've got DNA. So two main parts, the outer protein capsid and the inner genetic material. So, so we've got different types of viruses that all sort of look different, but they have the same basic structure, that protein shell and then that inner nucleic acid. Um, there are a couple of viruses I do want to know, I want you to know specifically about, and a bacteriophage is one of those. If there's a question about a virus on the end of course test, I can almost guarantee you it will be this kind of virus, because this is your classic go-to example of a virus. So this is a specific type of virus that, just as the name suggests, infects bacteria cells as their host. So they attach to a bacteria cell, you know, they're bouncing around, they find one, they attach to it, they inject their DNA, and then that bacteria is going to be used to produce more viruses. Okay, so let's talk about how does a, uh, how does a virus infect a cell? We know that viruses can make us sick, we know that they multiply in number, and that's what gives us those symptoms, but how does that happen? So the basic thing you need to know is that in order to replicate, a virus has to have a host cell. Remember, this is part of why we consider them non-living. So cell membranes have these 
different receptors on the outside of them that are very specific. The viruses are specific to those receptors. This is why you have viruses that only affect certain species because they only attach to certain receptors and if let's say it's a virus that infects cows then humans may not necessarily have that um, receptor on our cell membrane so it won't affect us. Once they attach to a host cell they inject their genetic material this is where this is what's going to be used to replicate or duplicate the virus and that's going to be what makes us sick so how does that happen it happens through one of two ways either the lytic cycle or the lysogenic cycle and that's what we're going to get get into here in a minute so the the lytic cycle um, is the fast one this is the one like the cold or the flu you will have one virus that enters your body and within days you're experiencing you know pretty severe symptoms so this is a very quick process so let's go through the summary here first of all we have viral DNA that is injected into the host cell that DNA then instructs the host cell to make more viral DNA and then that viral DNA is basically serving as instructions to make more viral structures so viral DNA is injected. The DNA is then read by the cell. It like becomes almost part of the cell. It's now taking instructions from the virus DNA instead of the cell's DNA. And that DNA is basically instructing it to make more viruses. So those structures then assemble into viruses. They're building the protein coat. They're making more of the viral DNA. They're, they're getting built into the actual viruses themselves. And then so many viruses are built that the cell actually lyses. And lice just means to, to burst, it explodes. And when the cell explodes, all of those viruses that were just built get then released into the cell. Or sorry, into the, uh, the cell's environment, whatever that may be. So now the cells are basically these virus making machines because those viruses that leave when the cell explodes, they go attached to new cells and then they inject the DNA into those cells and those cells become virus making machines. So you can see how exponentially the, the viral number increases very, very quickly. So here's just a, a picture showing the, the lytic cycle. And I believe this is number 10 on your notes organizer. So we have our virus attaching here. It's breaking down the cell's DNA so that the viral DNA is becoming the new set of instructions telling the cell to build viruses. So that's what it starts doing. It starts building the nucleic acids. It starts building the, the protein coats. Those sort of assemble into the different virus whole pieces. And then so many viruses are built that it causes the cell to burst. And then they're released into the cell's environment. And then the whole process basically starts over again, except now we're talking about we've gone from one to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in a very short period of time. So now they're going to find seven new cells and to make seven new viruses and so on and so forth. So this is a very short cycle. We call these active infections uh, because the symptoms appear in one to four days. Examples, of course, would be the common cold and then the flu. <coughs> So that is the lytic cycle. Think, uh, you know, the cell is lysing, lytic, lytic cycle. Okay, next is the lysogenic cycle. Think longer word, longer process. So lysogenic is the longer cycle, longer word, longer process. So once again, starts with the same thing. The viral DNA is, is injected into the host cell. But the difference here is that the viral DNA integrates itself into the chromosomes of the cells. So instead of breaking down the cell's DNA so that the viral DNA becomes the new set of instructions, it sort of squeezes itself into the sequence of, that already exists inside the host cell. So what that cell is going to do is it's going to do its normal thing. It's going to go through cell division. And now every time that cell divides and produces new cells, every one of the new cells is going to have that viral DNA that has sort of squeezed itself in there. So this is, a, this is a long process. It really just depends on the life cycle of the cell. So if the cell has a very short uh, replication or duplication amount of time then it's going to be a shorter process but some cells remember they take months to years to divide so these infected cells can remain dormant for a long period of time and then eventually they're going to activate and enter back into the the lytic cycle so here's just a picture this is called passive infections because they can remain dormant for many years so an example of that would be like herpes or hiv you know about those uh, diseases they the people may not even realize they have them for a very long period of time. So the virus 
attaches to the cell, it injects its DNA, that DNA then integrates itself into the host cell DNA, and when that cell goes through the cell division process through mitosis, it's now making new cells with that integrated DNA. Those cells are going to divide and then you're going to have more cells that have the, the viral DNA in it. And that's going to continue to happen until eventually they uh, make their way back into the lytic cycle, making new viruses, and then the viruses burst from the cell and, and the person can be very, very sick. So here's the, what I want you to draw for number 13 on your notes organizer, the connection between the lytic and lysogenic cycle. So they both start out the same way, and then depending what happens here, whether the you know, cell's DNA gets broken up to make new viruses, or whether the, D the viral DNA gets integrated into the cell's DNA, that's lytic versus lysogenic cycle. So things to remember, lytic, you're creating virus-making machines. This is a very short process. This is flu and cold. Lysogenic, you're integrating the DNA and that's going through cell division and this is a very long process where this you know this the cell may lay do, the virus may lie dormant for a very long period of time like herpes or HIV. Okay, another type of virus that I want you to be familiar with is just this term retroviruses and a retrovirus is a virus that has RNA as its nucleic acid as its core instead of DNA and it has this reverse transcriptase enzyme. So reverse, think backwards, transcriptase, we're talking about transcription and you remember transcription was going from DNA to RNA so reverse transcription would be going from RNA to DNA. So basically the process is very similar. The RNA RNA gets injected into the cell, but then that RNA has to go through reverse transcription and be made into DNA so that the DNA can be used as instructions for making viruses. An example would be HIV. HIV is a retrovirus. Okay, last we're going to talk about vaccines. Um, I want you to know these terms. A pathogen is anything that causes a disease. This could be viral, this could be bacterial, this could be caused by a protist or a fungi. Uh, but anything that causes a disease we call a pathogen. A vaccine is this uh, biological development that allows the immune system to develop a memory of those pathogens. So it allows your body to be able to fight off pathogens that they may not necessarily have experienced yet. So basically, Vaccines you'd use altered versions of pathogens to basically force your body to have an immune response to them without actually having the symptoms. This could be sort of like a uh, broken virus or a dead virus or something like that. Um, but it causes your body to produce these things called antibodies. And antibodies basically serve as markings. They're triggering to the body, they're signaling to the body, hey, this is a bad pathogen, you need to come and take care of it, and the white blood cells come and, uh, and you know, fight off the, the bacteria or the virus or whatever it is. And your body keeps those antibodies for the rest of your life, so that if you actually are exposed to the flu, for example, if your body has already produced antibodies to that, then they go straight to the flu virus, they signal, you know, white blood cells, you need to come here and take care of this, and you can fight it off without actually getting sick. So the key here is vaccines cause your body to produce antibodies, which then create a memory for that virus if you are ever actually exposed to it. And that's number 17 on your notes organizer. So here are some viruses uh, that we have vaccines for. Here's a line of children waiting to get the polio vaccine when, when that was a really big deal when that vaccine first came out. So list some of these under number 18 on your notes organizer. We have vaccines for the measles, the chicken pox, the flu, which we know we have to get every year because that virus mutates very easily. Polio, hepatitis, smallpox, rabies, and HPV. All right, that's it for today. Um, I hope you guys are having a great day.